hello guys welcome back to my channel it's your favorite girl online car for lab in the building in today's video i'll be answering some common interview questions i believe um this is one thing you'll be interested in so if you are here to do this subscribe to my channel share my videos like my videos and leave me a comment in the comment section below if you are new to my channel, I'm a biomedical scientist based in the United Kingdom and I talk about how you can relocate to the United Kingdom as a biomedical scientist. So sit back and enjoy today's video. Yeah, so today the first question I'll be answering is um, how do you troubleshoot QC failure? The question could be asked in different ways. The question could be like... Um, what do you do when QC fails? How do you troubleshoot QC failure? And so on. So, if I were to answer that question, I can tell them if um, there's a QC failure or if I'm to troubleshoot a QC failure, I'm going to follow the standard operating procedure of my laboratory. I'll follow the standard operating procedure. And I will do the following. I will first check the integrity of the sample. So by checking the integrity of the sample, I want to be sure that the sample is not expired. The sample I'm talking about now is the QC. I want to be sure that the QC is not expired. After doing this, I want to be sure that um, the volume of the QC sample is up to the expected volume. Now, depending on the procedure you are running, if, for example, you are running FPC and you are using the 6 mex SN analyzer, you should have at least 1 mil of um, QC sample. But if you are, for example, doing um, ESR, you should have at least 2 mil. So you can just tell them that depending on the analyzer, you want to be sure that you have enough volume to run that QC. After doing this, you want to be sure that because each time you get a new QC, there's a way you like enter the QC file, um, the batch and all of the information on the information processing unit that is attached to the analyzer such that when you run that QC, the, the analyzer knows that you're running this particular batch of QC. So you want to be sure that the batch of QC that you are running is the same. The information on that QC is the same as what you have on your analyzer. Yes. So the next thing is you've checked everything about your sample. You checked um, if the barcode is fine. Because if, for example, the barcode is crashed, the analyzer might not um, recognize it as the QC. So you want to be, you have, you've ensured that your QC is fine. The next thing you want to do is to you want to be sure that because you have confirmed that the problem obviously is not from the sample, you might want to quickly check up other problems so that because of course after checking that problem is done with your sample, you are good to go. You can run the sample and um, the QC. But what if the problem is with something else? You don't want to like keep running the QC, wasting the reagent, wasting time and all of that. So you want to be sure that, okay, the problem is not with the reagent. You check every of the reagents on the analyzer. It's something you can check on the IP you attach to the analyzer to be sure that because some reagents are visible anyways. You can see them because they are outside and attached to the analyzer. You can easily see them that, okay, they are enough, they are not enough. If you are sure the reagents are enough, you want to be sure that the reagent lot number that is on the IPU is the same as the lot number on the on the um, bottle or on the reagent um, container. After doing all of this, you can say, okay, after doing all of this, ensuring that my sample integrity and everything is intact, after ensuring that my reagent is enough, I would run the QC. So, this I'm saying a couple of times after doing this, the QC has passed. But if the QC fails, you can tell them that you would 
follow what is stated in your SOP again. You can tell them, okay, in your own facility, the next thing to do is to inform the senior BMS or the senior medical laboratory scientist, as the case may be. So, yeah. Now, the QC could, could fail for several reasons. It could fail for several reasons. So, if, for example, the QC failed as a result of um, is a systemic fault, maybe something that is wrong with the analyzer or something like that, you might need to like troubleshoot the analyzer because number one, you've confirmed that is, the problem is not with the reagent, the problem is not with the QC itself. You might want to like maybe troubleshoot the analyzer like you perform some uh, maintenance procedure like you shut down, start up and do all of that. Then you, because the problem now is with the analyzer, it means that you might need to like run since the last, you know, you've, you must have done a particular case. For example, if when you discover the problem was when you are trying to run the PMQC, like the QC for the afternoon, that was when you discovered the problem. Then you might need to like run samples from the last batch of QC that passed. Now you are not sure which sample has been affected or which sample has not been affected. So you might need to like bring out some of those samples. Maybe like, okay, maybe the time you ran the QC last was, let's say 9 a.m. And around 2, 3 p.m. you are running the QC, it fails. And you later discover that the problem is, you know, we've confirmed that, okay, the problem is not the sample, it's not the reagent. Now you feel like it's the, you've seen that it's the analyzer. Now you might need to like, because we the purpose of doing this QC is to ensure that we are producing results that are genuine, that are reproducible, that are true. You understand? So you might need to like recall previous samples that have been run after the last QC that passed. Now, of course, you might not be able to like rerun all, but you want to like pick maybe sample. The last QC you ran was like nine, right? You can pick sample that came in around nine thirty. Sample that you run around 10 30, you just pick out different times, then you also pick out different range of results. Maybe where you add high um, MCHC, low HP, different values, you just pick them randomly. You just select a range of samples since the last successful QC and you rerun those samples on another analyzer. Now, a norm, a a fantastic lab or a standard lab should have a backup analyzer, you get. So you run this on the second analyzer to determine if the QC failure has affected any of the results. Now, if, for example, by the time you um, check and you see that, okay, all those samples you run, the results that the former, um, the, 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 the result that the analyzer that is giving you, you give, is still within there's something like each lab will have an acceptable limit like the result is still within the acceptable limit you understand then um you can just leave the um samples like that and allow them go but if there's a significant difference in the rerun test that you did you need to amend the results on your LIMS and you just follow the procedures as stated on your SOP. So, of course, they will not expect you to, like, say, blah, blah, blah. You might not even go deep like this, but they just want you to, like, they just want to, like, know that you have an idea of troubleshooting, you know what to do and that. If, after doing all of this, you know, you've confirmed that your samples are fine, uh, maybe after turning back the analyzer. Now, rerunning the sample is not on that same analyzer, you know. Because the analyzer has issues, we, we don't want to. We want to confirm that the results we have released are okay. So that same analyzer, by the time you bring it back on, maybe you run the QC again and it pass fine. If it does not pass, you might need to like maybe call the engineers that, for example, the sysmex engineers. They might tell you what to do. 
and they might even come around to fix it themselves. So, but the mind is that you ensure that you are not running any sample on a field analyzer or analyzer that has issues. I hope you guys are enjoying today's video. Okay, so let's move to the next question. So the next question says, what would you see in a peripheral blood film of iron deficiency anemia? So um, you can just tell them that, okay, um, it depends. But for me, I will just answer like this and tell them that um, in a peripheral blood film of iron deficiency anemia, I will see some features in the red cell. But um, before proceeding to doing a peripheral blood film in the first place, there must have been a full blood count result and a full blood count result of um, an, a suspected iron deficiency anemia would look like, for example, the HB value would be below the reference range. Sometimes the MCV and MCH may or may not be low. You understand? So they know that you have, you are not, because you can't just make very fair blood film. There must have been a full blood count result done one time, one time or the other. Then you go ahead and say, now, um, in the peripheral blood film of iron deficiency anemia patients, you'll be seeing microcytic and hypochromic cells. Now you can go ahead to tell them that this is not only seen in iron deficiency anemia. It could also be seen in some other forms of anemia like thalassemia. Do you understand? Okay. So then you go back and tell them that you would see hypochromic and microcytic cells like you said. Um, you would also see very varying um, size of red cells, that's anisocytosis, and varying shapes of red cells, poikilocytosis, and um, yeah, that's you see all of that. But you can't just make a definitive diagnosis from that. You will now say that um, you you would actually suggest that um further test is being done like um a serum fer ferritin test yeah you need to like do a serum ferritin test to like know the level of you know um ferritin is like that protein that ion is attached to you get so like you, you really just want to know the level of ion in the person's um serum so if 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 it falls within range then you know that okay, you're not dealing with iron deficiency anemia. But if it falls below the expected range, then you're dealing with iron deficiency anemia. Something like that. And um you are good to go. You are good to go. So just um just just give them an idea of this and that. So yeah, there's really no one way approach to it, but the, the the mind is that when you are asked any question, you, you you like don't you don't jump to answering the question itself. If possible, you kind of give a background information regarding that question. I hope you guys enjoy today's video. If you enjoy today's video, please leave me a comment in the comment section below. If you like to see more of this kind of video, let me know in the comment section below. So. I hope you enjoyed these two questions that I answered and you have an idea of what to do, how to answer similar questions. Okay, for now it's a bye from your girl, Olaika Falabi. See you in my next one.